Well, um, this morning, uh, this morning I'd like to speak to you out of the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus uh, 33, chapter 33, we'll also be looking at some in chapter 34 as well, the book of Exodus chapter 33, if you want to open up there. And uh, the title of my message is Following Moses in the Pursuit of God. It's Following Moses in the Pursuit of God. And uh, if you like, you can read with me uh, starting at verse 11, and I'll read on down through uh, 34, about uh, 9, so... You know, somebody said before, the most, uh, the only infallible part of a man's message is the reading of the word, you know, so we always want to hear, we always want to pray, Lord, give me light on your word, when the, when the word's being read, in verse 11 in chapter 33, it says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, so notice this conversation between Moses and the Lord. This is really what this is, and then we have a, a manifestation of God, as we'll see. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, this is the Lord, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, Moses says this, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And, Moses, and the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my, this is the Lord in response. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show, show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and then you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by morning and come up in the in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. And this here we see the in verse 18, Moses prayed, show me your glory. We see the, the answer to this, and the Lord's promised it, this manifestation of God. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I've found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Let's pray together. Father, we look up to you, and Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would consider your, your people in this place. Lord, I pray, consider me as one of your people, and Lord, I pray that we pray with Moses. Lord, show us your glory. As much as in this passage, I pray, Lord, you might be pleased to help me to, to bring it out. Lord, we pray that you would come. Lord, we need a word. Lord, we need a word for, from You. And Lord, if it's not You that come, then Lord, no one would be helped. But if You come, then Lord, we can't help but be helped. Lord, show us Your glory. Show us Your face. Moses prayed it. Lord, You have this text for us to call upon Your name with. Lord, show us, show us Your glory. Lord, be revealed in, in the preaching of Your Word. Lord, stand beside each one of us and proclaim the name. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my message again is Following Moses in the Pursuit of God. And if you're familiar with Exodus, you know this, that there is uh, a lot that's happened thus far in the book of Exodus. Uh, God has called His people out with great signs and wonders. There's there's been the, the manna in the wilderness. There's been the water from the rock. Uh, and, Mo and Moses has been called up by God on Mount Sinai to receive uh, the instructions. You know, we know also part of that is the, the Ten Commandments. He's come, he's come down now. Uh, remember the Lord let him know that the people, because Moses had been long delayed, they turned, they turned to the golden calf that Aaron had made for them. So there's, there's turmoil, uh, so to speak, in Israel. Really, you just read through Exodus, you see this about the people, that as we read in our text already, it says they're a stiff-necked people. And Moses, Moses is called to lead this kind of people. He's got, it, he's got it worse than any pastor has ever had it, probably, just with the magnitude of his ministry, but also this, that the Lord has called him to shepherd a people that are stiff-necked people. Now there we know there was a remnant within there that were the true, the true followers of the Lord. But I mention all that to say that Moses has a lot of pressure on him in his life. The Lord has just said in the, the beginning of chapter 33, look there with me. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's calling, he's saying, take the land, right? There's been this promise made. Moses, take the land. And so the Lord's fulfilling His promise to your offspring, I will give it. And I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And for the people, it was a d disastrous word. In, in verse 4, we see that. So think about Moses here. He's been called to do this, this huge task of taking the land. And then the Lord has said to them that I, I will not go up among you. Now, that's not saying that the Lord is forsaking Moses. We know... Uh, it's not just a New Testament reality. It's always been the case. You look at the Psalms, it says the Lord will not forsake His people. But here when the Lord's saying that He won't go up amongst His people, it's more having to do with the wickedness that is there. The, the rebellion. The rebellion that is there. It's almost like a grace of the Lord. I won't go up with you lest I consume you. They, if God consumes you, you perish, right? But yet, just like any godly man would, with this pressure and this 
this great task that the Lord's put before him, Moses goes to prayer. He goes and calls on the name of the Lord. Look at verse 12. And really in this passage, what you see is a discourse in Moses and in God. And I think that it will greatly help us in our own pursuit of the Lord and it will help us see certain things about the Lord that can help us help us in that, in that pursuit. Notice, notice the godly man's prayer, Moses. He, he's got argument in his prayer in verse 12. See, you say to me, bring up this people. So he's saying, Lord, you've told me to bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Possibly he's uh, anticipating another Aaron, like, like just back in the book of Exodus. Or maybe he's wondering, since the Lord won't go, uh, who will he send with me? He says, yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, show me now your ways. So he reminds the Lord, Lord, you said I found favor. You said I'm your, I'm your people, that you're, that you're going to be with me. Lord, if I found this favor in your sight, show me your ways. You notice his reasoning, his, his argument there in prayer. It's a, good, it's a good example for us. And he says, what's he asking? Show me your ways. Why? That I may know you. Show me your ways that I may know you. And consider also that this nation is your people. So he has a great desire that he would know the Lord, but also a great desire, just like Moses, for the people. And it's interesting, there, that could be a whole other sermon just on Moses' love that he had for his people. I mean, back in chapter 32, the Lord was set to consume his people and saying in verse 19, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So the Lord's like, let me alone. Let me consume the, this wicked people. Moses, I'm going to take you and make a great nation out of them. But Moses, we know the great intercessor that he was by God's grace. He stood in the gap, so to speak, and the Lord relented from that. He had such a, a love for people as well. But he wanted to know the Lord's ways. His argument here now in prayer. And he prevails with the Lord. Look in verse 14. As he's arguing with the Lord. Lord, I'm your people. Lord, you must show me your ways. Lord, I want, I want to know you. And very quickly, it seems, in verse 14. And he said, the Lord says, in response to Moses' prayer, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And it's it's interesting to me how quickly the Lord responds to the prayer, the desperate prayer of Moses. That He allows Moses to pre prevail upon Him. You know that we, are, uh, we wrestle with God in prayer, right? But it's, it's that the Lord allows Himself to be wrestled with. That in some way, it's some kind of delight with the Lord that we would be earnest before Him and bring these kind of reasonings and these arguments before Him in prayer. But yet, how, how quickly He answers he answers Moses with a sweet promise of the Lord. A very sweet promise. Moses, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And what, what, a great, what a great consolation it would have been to him to hear something like that. With all, that, all the enemies that he knew about the great nations that the Lord was going to have him take. All the senses that, Lord, I'm in the midst of a wicked people. You've called me to, to, to lead these people who, who, are, who are wicked many most of them, it seems. What a consolation it would have been. And he said, my presence will go with you. What, is he, what he's saying is, when he says my presence, if you look that word up, it just means my face. My face will go with you. Well, that basically is God's countenance. You know, you read in the Scriptures and it talks about, it talks about, Lord, let your face shine upon us. Lord, look upon us. Let your, you look at the Psalms. Let your face shine upon us. What's being said is, it's not just the sensible sense of God's presence, though it is that. Certainly it's that. It's, it's also more than that. It's that God will be showing favor to His people. He will be giving deliverance after deliverance. He will be there. He will fight for them. He will be among them. He's given this promise to Moses about, about His presence. Uh, there was enemies on every side. The Lord was promising to subdue them. But let me ask you this. Thinking about that promise there in 14, the, where it says, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Is that a promise uh, 
for every believer. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him, in Jesus. All the promises of God. Speaking about the promises of restoration. All the promises that are in the Old Testament. Uh, the believer can take as their own. We can take this one right here. That God is saying to us in the pursuit of God. That all Scripture is God-breathed. It's profitable that we might be built up. He's saying to us, My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. Think about things that the Lord's calling you to in your own life. Some of us, we have things before us that are very clear that we know Lord, we need, we need your presence. Others of us, that day may be, you know, a couple weeks from now or whatever. Whoever it is, wherever you're at in life, this can be an encouragement to you. He says, my presence will go with you. You ever thought about the fact that God could have left us without the sensible sense of his presence? He could have preserved us all the way to the end without a shadow of a doubt, by His power, without any senses of His presence. What I mean by that, uh, the believer knows it all too well. It's no mystery to the children of the burning heart, someone said, that you know what God's presence is. It's the supernatural uh, manifestation of God where you literally sense His nearness. You sense that not only that you take it by faith that God is here, but you literally sense God is here. God is with me. God is, God is here. I sense his presence and think about that what the God would give us his presence along the way there's that hymn that says uh, we sing it it's called great is thy faithfulness and it says thy own dear presence to cheer and to God God gives his presence there is times yes that he withdraws that presence there's times of darkness and confusion but for the believer you know it all too well he always comes again doesn't he fresh grace again and again there's never been a time that he hasn't Come with a sensible sense of His presence. And what, what a gift. What a gift He's given. But not only that, but His presence is also, can also speak about just His strength and His power. And in, Psalm, in Psalm 105, you see that seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence uh, continually. And right there, the presence is the same word. It is seek His face continually, but it's right alongside with His strength. It has to do with His strength. It has to do with His acts. The signs of His favor had to do with His presence. You know in your own life that little answered prayers or little things, that, little things that the Lord does, big things that the Lord does, it just shows you God is with me. God is acquainted with all my ways. He strength, his, his presence is with us in that way as well. His deliverance is from sin. His deliverance is from the enemy. The enemy. His deliverance is from physical enemies, whatever it may be. That the Lord has promised us to have His presence on this great journey that we're on. Moses was, going, was called to take His people to the land, but we're called to go. We're headed toward the heavenly Jerusalem. And He says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. That is, God has promised to us, as He promised to Moses, deliverance from enemies, as I, as I mentioned but also inward peace. He's promised us rest. And the believer knows it. It ebbs and flows. Yeah, but we do know the witness of the Spirit. We know when the Spirit manifests Himself with our spirit, letting us know that we are children of God. And that peace that surpasses all understanding that is not some mere feeling. It's not something that you drank too much coffee or whatever it is. It's a supernatural thing. It's a supernatural work of God. He gives his peace. The Bible says God will speak peace into His people. He gives rest in that way. And ultimately, He will give us rest in the sense that this ultimate rest that we're headed to. The place where the believer will finally lay down uh, their weapons, so to speak. So finally, you know, they won't need the armor there. You won't need to fight the devil there. You won't need to fight your own sin in that place of rest. He promises us peace, but this was a great comfort to Moses, but we see something more about the depth of his heart. His depth of his heart for the Lord. In verse 15, he says, and he said, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. The, just the comfort that Moses derived from this promise, yet it made him think about, Lord, 
Certainly there was consolation there. But Lord, he thought, if you were to remove your presence, Lord, I do not want to go. Lord, if you were to take back your hand, if you won't go with us, if you won't be there in your mighty acts, in your presence, in your strength, in the sensible sense of your presence there, Lord, we don't want to go. And that is really uh, the heart of the believer. I mean, Moses had been promised this land flowing with milk and honey. You know, somebody could have said, well, if the Lord won't go with us, at least we got this land flowing of milk and honey. But yet we see the heart of the believer, don't we? That it's not about a land, it's about a person. It's about the Lord. You know you know that if you are truly a Christian, that you want to know the Lord. There has been something done in your heart that you have these longings and these desires after Christ that you never had. Even before, if you were a professing Christian, you never had that. You're without, without God in the world. But yet, the true believer knows it. Mo- Moses knew it. And we have that heart, don't we? Lord, I don't want to go if you won't go with me. Lord, I don't even want to go through this day if you won't go with me. I don't want to go out to the evangelism later if you won't go with me. If the senses of your presence. And he says, with me. Moses gets it, he gets it so, uh, he gets it so, personal you know it's not just that he's crying out for his people lord i want you to go with me there's dangers on every side i don't want to go if you won't go with me and we can sense that in different things that the lord is calling us to for he says for how shall it be known in verse 16 how shall it be known that i found favor in your sight i and your people is it not you're going with us so that we are distinct i and your people from every other people on the face of the earth So Moses not only wants the sense of God's presence, God's help in his own personal life, he's asking for God's help for the sake of God's name in the world. Isn't it not this, that the fact that you are with us, that we are distinct among all the people on the face of the earth? And that is true of of God's people today, right? That what is distinct about us, this is what's distinct, is that we know God and God is with us. And God is for us. And God, by the Spirit, He has put His Spirit to dwell within us. You know, and this is just something so great that we ought to desire more and more for God's glory in the world. And we can take it as an argument before the Lord in prayer in our workplaces and wherever the Lord has us. Lord, be with me. Show that You are with me. Show in a mighty way that I am different than all the rest of the people on the face of the earth. Show that... You are my God. I want people to know that there is a God in heaven. I want people to know that I'm just not speaking about some, some Christ. I'm not like the false professor that speaks about Jesus but denies Him by their work. Lord, I, know, I want people to know and see the reality. I want them to see the reality like Moses had when he came down off the mountain. He had the shining face. Or like Stephen there in the book of Acts when it says that his face shone like an angel. They literally saw that. There can be... There can be real senses that people can literally see something of the glory of God on the countenance of a believer. Certainly, it's more than we know. And and also also that it says about the disciples that they, they perceive that they had been with Jesus. Lord, I want people to know that I've been with You. I want such a reality in my life. Not just for my own sake, though that is a good desire to have great reality with the Lord. But I want reality for the sake of your name in the world, that people, people would know you through that. And do mighty exploits through me. Show me your presence. Be with me in mighty ways. Be with me in the mighty conversions. Be with me in mighty ways and answering of my prayers. Lord, I don't want to go if you won't go with me. Lord, show that you're with me. And that is a prayer that we ought to be bringing before the Lord so much more than we do. And we'd see so much more of God's reality. In this text, he invites us to it. He put it there for our edification. And look how the Lord responds to His desires. The Lord says in verse 17, And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now, He's already said it there. Um, He's promised my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. But yet, as Moses has continued to plead with the Lord, the Lord gives another consolation. And I just, as I'm thinking about this, it's just, just behold the sweetness of the Lord, the compassion of God. How timely are His words and how 
how uh, sweet are his consolations that he gives to us and how encouraging is he he is the god of all comfort he is the god of all encouragement and he encourages moses he answers him this very thing that you have spoken i will do for you have found favor in my sight and i know you by name and moses knew he he knew that he had found favor in the lord's sight he knew that the lord knew him by name why does the lord need to speak it to us the lord would have us to know that we are his people and he would he would have us to know that we are loved by Him. And this can be a great encouragement for those that struggle with assurance at times, you know, or for long seasons, whatever it may be, that can happen. And that the Lord wants His people to have assurance. He wants His people to know that He is with them. He wants us to know that we are greatly loved by Him. This very thing for you, you've asked for me, I will do. You have found favor in my sight, for I know you by name. I think of uh, the Gospel of Luke that when the, when the angel came to Mary and said, Behold, you found favor in the Lord's sight or something like that. It's just God just wants us to know that we're greatly loved and we found favor with Him. He says it again. Uh, I mentioned before the Psalm 85 where it says, The Lord will uh, hear what the Lord will say, for the Lord will s- speak peace to His people. And I would ask you this, in your own prayer life, in your own communion with the Lord, do you, you speak to the Lord, obviously, but do you listen to the Lord? The Lord gives Moses a consolation. He could have been so wrapped up in his own prayer that he didn't even hear what the Lord was saying. And the Lord speaks to us. You know, there's so many, I find it out more and more. The Lord has such timely words throughout each day, such promises or script. Uh, scriptures that as you're praying about something they come to mind there's encouragement there there's help there sometimes there's correction there it's from it's from the Lord now we know that the devil can use the scriptures to condemn us and things like that and it will, if you're being pushed further and further away from the Lord then you can know where that's coming from with the scriptures but the Lord does speak peace to his people do you listen to him do you believe him when he do you believe him when he when he speaks to you in that way And Moses has been comforted by the Lord. He's been promised of His presence. But just like it is in the heart of every true believer, there is a healthy discontent there. The more more that he sees of the Lord, the more he he wants to know Him. The more he wants to dwell with Him. Look in verse 18. With all this, Moses, knowing who he was before the Lord. That's one thing that we could preach a whole sermon on. Moses' boldness before the Lord. He just knew he could he could reason with the Lord. He could go before him and he went before him with this plea. Moses said, please show me your glory. He beseeches the Lord. He begs the Lord how imagine how it sounded to hear him pray this way. Lord, please, please show me your glory. Lord, I must have you. I must know you. Please show me your glory. In the in the NAS it says, I pray you, I pray you, please show me your glory, the desperation that is there with Moses. And, and I would ask you, is that desperation still in your life? You know, sometimes people can look back on their Christian life and say, oh, when I was first converted, I was so, I was so passionate, I was so desperate. It's not supposed to be that way. That's not good. If, if you're more desperate when you were first converted than you are now, something's not right there. And what I'm saying is that You need to pray and ask the Lord, give me this desperation. Give me this desperation for you. Moses was desperate to know the Lord. Please, show me your glory. I pray you. And look how the Lord responds. You think when you pray and ask the Lord to show, Lord, show me your glory, you think it's a vain thing? You think it's something that it just kind of like maybe goes past the Lord as he as he sits upon the throne. He takes no notice of it. Look at the Lord, what He says in verse 19. He hears that prayer and He makes a promise. And He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He says, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you. I'm going to proclaim before you my name. The name has to do with 
uh, who God is. It's proclaiming truth about God, who He is at all of His attributes contain. Uh, we could say are wrapped up in saying of His name. All of who God is. And what the Lord is promising to Moses is that prayer that you prayed there to show me your glory. Oh, I'm going to show you my glory. I'm, I'm going to pass by before you and I'm going to proclaim the name. I'm going to give you a, a personal encounter with me. I'm going to proclaim my name, the Lord. And we see something here too, don't we, about what the glory of God is actually. What is the glory of God? What, it, what is Moses really praying when he says, Lord, please show me your glory? Some people said God's glory is his manifest excellencies. His, the manifestation of who God is. Some other, others have said it's his holiness going public. Just like in Isaiah chapter 6, where it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You would think, or however it reads, you would think it would say, the whole earth is filled with His holiness, right? But no, it says the whole earth is filled with His what? It says with His glory. It's His holiness being put on display. It's a proclamation of who He is. It's uh, God, His glory is the making known of Himself. And this is what we see here in this text. I will proclaim before you the name. And we, if you look down where this manifestation actually happens in, there in 5 and 6, this is interesting that it actually happened on the next day. But notice this. And I want to point something out to you. Notice what the Lord says. Uh, the, and I want you to notice how the Lord is so eager to reveal Himself to His people. So eager. More than you know. More than you believe. I assure you that. It's like... He's going to do it tomorrow, but yet notice how the Lord just spills over with, it's like He can't wait just to reveal something to His people. Not that He's lonely or anything like that. He's, self, you know, he's completely content within Himself, but yet such is His love that He wants to reveal Himself. He can't even wait. He says, I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He speaks about His electing love. He speaks about His sovereign grace. The Lord's freedom to choose whom He will and have mercy on whom He will. He goes ahead and spills over even before this manifestation that we'll look at. I think that's really encouraging to think the Lord wants you to see more of His glory than you want to see of His glory. And He's more eager and He quickly responds to us. Yes, there may be a time of tarrying. For Moses, it was the next day when God gave this manifestation that He had promised. But yet, it is that way in degrees. That we, the more that we ask, the more that we see. And I would just say, if Moses wouldn't have asked this, would he have seen this? I don't know. I mean, the Lord can do whatever He wants to do, right? He is free. But yet, we have here that why did this happen? Moses said, Lord, show me Your glory. He asked for it. Do you ask to see God's glory? How much have you? How much? How mu not that there's some law about it or anything like that. You know, sometimes you think, well, I haven't really been seeing much of the glory of God. I don't know much of the presence of God. How much do you ask for the presence of God? How much do we ask for the presence of God? And this is encouragement to us, isn't it? The Lord responds to those requests. And look, look at the way that he responds. He says, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you. But in verse 20, he says, But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So it's almost like Mo the Lord knew what Moses was asking. We don't know exactly if Moses was, had this in mind. But it's like Moses was asking. He was so desperate to know the Lord. Lord, show me the full expanse of your glory. Show me, I want to see you in the unapproachable light. I want to see you in all your glory, even though it, it's going to kill me. And the Lord like responds and says, Moses, I can't show you that because you're not going to be able to live if I show you that glory. But this one thing that I will do for you, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to stand beside you. If you stand here on this rock in verse 21, my glory is going to pass by you. I'm going to put you in this cleft of the rock and I'm going to cover you with my hand until I have passed by. What's going on here? 
Uh, you see stuff about back, my hand, I'm going to pass by. The Lord uses human-like language uh, to communicate with us. When He's talking about His hand, it's not a literal hand. It's like, but you could think about it this way. Imagine Moses in this cave or this cliff of the rock. The Lord puts him there and He's going to pass by. and He covers him with His hand. Why? To protect him from the full expanse of His glory. That he might not be consumed and die, and die there. I'm going to cover you. It's like a place of intimacy. It's in the cleft of the rock. We, we, we sing that song, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. And He puts him, His hand over there and He passes by him and proclaims the name. He says, you cannot see my face, but you're going to see my back. What, oh, you ever thought about that? What does that mean? How, how is the Lord going to show us his back. Again, human language to communicate something to us uh, about, about Himself. Imagine if uh, somebody walked by that door right there real quick, and they walked by real fast, and I said, hey, who was that? You're like, I don't know. I just got a glimpse of them. All I saw was their back. I just got a glimpse of who they were. Now, that's a kind of a way to understand what's going on here. It's not a full expanse because with the Lord, that glimpse, that view of His back, that, it's like a man passing by. You see the glimpse of Him. That one glimpse of the Lord, Him being who He is, so glorious as He is, that that one, that one glimpse of His glory leads Moses to fall on His face in worship when the Lord proclaims His name. It's not something that's distant. It's something that's very intimate. Notice how the Lord stands beside him and proclaims the name. It's a personal encounter. And God, God does this with every one of His, every one of his people. Well, let's look at that revelation, though, that the Lord, as, as the Lord called him up on the mount, there in verse 30, chapter 34, verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud. You know the cloud? You look back through Exodus. This was something that Moses had seen, that they were led by the cloud. And uh, many times uh, the cloud is uh, symbolic of God's presence in the Old Testament. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. Notice that he stood with him there. It's not a distant thing. And proclaimed the name of the Lord, the revelation of his glory, who he is. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord. He, he speaks of he is the existing one. He is the one who is Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious. Notice what he's doing here. The Lord could have done a lot of things. He could have said, the Lord, the Lord, a wrathful God. It would have been true of him. He could have said a jealous God. We see that even in this book, I believe, in chapter 34. But yet, look, this is a personal revelation to his people. Look what he says. And he wants, the Lord wants us to know these things. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. He's patient. Notice all the attributes of God as God reveals Himself. You see, God's glory is a revelation of who He is. The truth about God. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love or loving kindness for thousands or to a thousandth generation. Throughout the ages, God is going to be calling His elect and calling forth His people and having compassion on whom He will have compassion. But yet, He also reveals us this, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, who will by no means clear the guilty. We must understand something of His justice here if we really are to appreciate His love, right? It is His, his wrath and His justice that magnifies His love. This, this expanse, this proclamation that God gives to Moses as He reveals Himself, forgiving Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Basically, what that is, I, I take it, is not some generational curse thing, but what it is is that as the curse inherits to all men and as men grow up with their, many times the influence of the father can have something on those sins, but it more has to do with this curse that spread to all men, the ultimate father, this curse that God will, is bringing out judgment on the wicked throughout generation to generation. Yeah, that magnifies his love to us. But to Moses, he wants them to know all these actions of his love towards him. This, 
if you just look at these words, you go to like blueletterbible.com, there's all these verbs. I pass by, I, loving kindness or whatever. I'm not sure if that's a verb, but there's just all these verbs wrapped up in there. It's like the Lord just wants His people to know in this revelation of Himself that I show active love towards my people. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And Moses, you have found favor on my sight. You can see my glory. You, you, can, you can know me. It's a personal encounter. And Moses, it says, quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. He quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. And you know, you think about this passage, you, you think back to this, God, all of God's dealings with Moses, and sometimes you can think, oh, to be Moses. Oh, to be one of the saints of old. To, to be there and see the parting of the Red Sea and to see the manna in the wilderness and see the water from the rock and to have this kind of manifestation that Moses had here. To have the light that Moses had. But really, biblically speaking, Moses wouldn't, we wouldn't say, uh, we would say, oh, to be Moses. But Moses would say, oh, to be you. Oh, to be us. Oh, to be us. Why do I say that? Jesus said in Matthew 13, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Moses in Deuteronomy 34 is called a prophet. Jesus is saying here, those prophets of old, all the manifestations that they've had, all the senses of glory that they've had, He's saying, blessed are your eyes, for they see what they see. Because prophets and kings, they long to look at what you now see before your eyes. They did not have Christ incarnate yet. They did not see. I mean, it says in Galatians, before our eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly proclaimed. Uh, Proclaim as crucified before our eyes, before the eyes of faith. We have seen much more glo glory than Moses ever had. You know, we uh, he had the Exodus, but yet we've experienced our own Exodus. What the Exodus actually pointed to, the ultimate reality. You know, he saw manna in the wilderness, but we have seen the one in John chapter 6 who said he's the true manna that has come down from heaven, right? And we have eaten by, of him by faith, and we found his. His flesh to be true food and His blood to be true drink. And we, we have seen our own manifestation of the Lord. Here with, with the Lord, that the Lord reveals His mercy and His justice displayed. But we have seen uh, the, a greater manifestation of His love and in His justice in the cross of Christ. That in that cross, as it says in Romans chapter 3, that it was God proclaiming that He is righteous, that He is just, that He will not look over your sin. He will just not sweep it under the rug, but also His mercy and His grace, and that He would provide a substitute, that God Himself would become a man and take the wrath of God and in the resurrection. That we have seen more, more light than Moses. Moses, God's face was hidden from Moses, but the Bible says that the God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have, we have looked upon the, the one who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Yes, there is something that we are waiting for. We're waiting for that full expanse where we see Christ in all of, all of His glory. But yet the Bible says about the believer in this age has more light than Moses ever had. We have a greater access than he ever had. He had to go to the temple. Yeah, there was personal manifestations that he had, but yet we see here he went to uh, the tent of meaning, I mean, and that it says he spoke with God as with friend with friend, but yet in the new covenant, every true Christian, every true Christian is the favorite. Every true Christian has a greater access than Moses ever had. Now maybe in the experience of Moses, Maybe in his experience, but he ha we have a door open to us. We have a path to, to the Lord that f to freely come before him in a way that Moses never could, that Moses longed to look into, that he was not able. 
So I would, just, I would just leave us with thinking about these things that we need to pray. We need to pray, Lord, show me all these things. Show me that I'm in a better covenant than, than Moses was in. Show me that we have a greater ministry like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about two different ministries. It talks about the ministry of Moses that... Yeah, there was glory there. But then it talks about the ministry of righteousness. It's like it says this ministry of righteousness far exceeds this one in glory. The, the stars shine all, all brightly at night, but when the sun comes out, it eclipses those stars, doesn't it? To where that glory overrides the glory of those stars. And the ministry of righteousness that the Christian has, we have more glory. We see more glory than Moses ever had. A greater ministry. A greater access. More light. They they saw Christ from afar. It was, yes, Moses in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, that he considered the reproach of Christ greater than all the fleeting pleasure. They saw Christ from afar. I don't deny it. And what they saw, I mean, whatever Moses saw, I mean, it made it in the book of Revelation. It says the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, right? He had, oh, he had all kinds of light, but yet a greater access the Christian has. More light than even Moses ever had. And we just need to pray, Lord, show me the glory of all these things. Spend the rest of our life praying. Show me the glory. Not in unbelief, not in despair, but with an expectancy, realizing that God wants us to know these things. God wants us to reveal the glory of Christ. He wants us to show more of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. More light, Lord. So spend the rest of your life asking more light, Lord. More glory, Lord. And expect and press on. If you really want to know it, where is it going to be? It's going to be having to do with His Word. It's not just going to be some experience, though though we ought to be having experience. If we don't want to live on those things, we ought to be having real encounters with the Lord, you know. More and more as we grow in grace. We need to ask for more of them. But it's going to be by the Word. It's going to be the light and the truth. Lord, send out Your light and Your truth. What is light? It's illumination. It's illumination on the Word of God. It's it's God taking truths and opening our minds up and our hearts and planting them there and showing before our eyes of our heart, of our inner man, the glory of Christ. It is no small thing. This is our pursuit. It is the pursuit of God. It is the pursuit of Christ. To see His glory. And this is is the thing that we wait for. This This is what heaven will be. We start it now. We taste of it now. But we'll taste more deeply there for sure. And that will be the joy of all the ages. And that will be our pursuit for now and forever. And eternity is the pursuit of God. It will be more and more of His glory. More and more of who He is. More and more of what He's done. For us in Christ, and it will only get greater and greater and greater and greater forever, forever, and a day. So let's pray with Moses. Lord, show me your glory. Amen.